My name is Pete McCall. Welcome to episode 133 of All About Fitness. Before I get into the formal introduction for this episode's guest, I first want to say thanks to my friend Janelle. It really, I really appreciate your uh, your listening to the podcast and your drive, your recent drive from Seattle down to uh, Southern Washington. It really means a lot when friends and colleagues take the time to listen to what we're doing here on All About Fitness. So Janelle, thank you very much for that. And for listeners, I really appreciate your tuning in, and I appreciate the notes. I do want to apologize. I've been a little dark the last you know, period of time. I think that I've been focused on a few other things, some personal, some professional, but I got great news going forward. You know, up until now, I've been doing all about fitness basically out of my closet. I have a makeshift studio set up, and I either have conversations with people via computer or at various trade shows and conferences. One of the organizations I've been working with, and I've been doing a little bit of writing for them, speaking, and actually some podcasting last year, is IDEA. IDEA is a trade association of fitness professionals, the International Dance Exercise Association. They were the first kind of certification, and IDEA actually spawned, founded the American Council on Exercise and established as a separate organization. So for people that didn't know that history, there it is. IDEA is owned by a company called Active Interest Media. Active Interest Media owns magazine titles such as Yoga Journal, Oxygen, Backpacker, Ski. They have a very big presence in the outdoor health wellness space. Well, this past year, they had me do a podcast for fitness professionals, specifically for trainers and instructors, and now we're evolving All About Fitness into a national podcast as part of the Active Interest Media podcasting group. So this is a brand new thing that's being put together all about fitness is the first pod- podcast coming on, so you're going to see some changes. The most, the content's going to stay the same, pretty much the same. I'm going to have access to some of the some of the people that will be featured in the various magazines owned by Active Interest, which is really cool. I'm going to get made, and we're getting a lot of distribution on here, so you're not going to see content on All About Fitness change much, but hopefully we see more of All About Fitness and, and more exposure and better distribution. Because I've been doing great about booking guests, but what I don't have time for is to get out there and really promote the podcast. I've gotten great feedback. And I really, My goal is to bring you the guests that can give you the information that can change your life. And this episode starts with one of the best out there, Miss Jen Wiederstrom. Now, before I go into the formal introduction for Jen, many of you may know her from The Biggest Loser. Many of you may know her from American Gladiators. And in all honesty, I hadn't met, I didn't know her. I, yeah, I've seen the show. I'd watched it when somebody else was in the role of the female trainer. And I just hadn't paid much attention. When, I, when Jen and I met, it was a couple years ago, we were at the same event. There was something going on with, with a major apparel company. And we were both guests there. And I talked to her a little bit. All I knew was here's this very friendly woman, incredibly outgoing, very personable, with some killer looking. If you don't know Jen, she has some of the fiercest looking arms I've ever seen. And it wasn't until the next day that somebody told me, oh, yeah, she's been on TV and yada, yada, yada. You know what? That doesn't matter. Here's what I do know about Jen. Jen is passionate and and Jen is enthusiastic and Jen is very genuine. (laughs) It's a little pun there. Uh, Jen is very genuine, and I mean that. In the conversation today, we talk about coaching. We talk about the difference between training. A trainer tells you what to do. Do this exercise. A coach does something different, and Jen personifies a coach. What I hear from her in a conversation today is the idea that if 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 you want to make changes in your life, the first muscle you have to start with is your mind, that muscle between your ears. Once you can train that muscle between your ears, as Jen points out, everything else falls into place. And to give you an example of how that happened, one of the most impressive, I mean, she's absolutely gorgeous. She's incredibly friendly. She's doing a tremendous amount of stuff out there to promote physical activity. But for me, the most impressive thing about Jen that tells me everything I need to know about her is the fact that she walked on to a college program and started throwing the hammer. And now for people that don't know hammer throwing or, or, or throwing sports, I had a roommate in college who threw shot put and he threw discus and he threw hammer. I spent a lot of time with the throwers in college. First of all, the average thrower, both male and female, if you're a Game of Thrones fans, think of a thrower as like Brianna of Tarth. You know, female throwers look like Brianna of Tarth. They're big women. Male throwers are huge. They're tall. If, in order to be a good thrower, you need to be tall. It's all about levers. The faster you can accelerate. Anyway, Jen had success at the hammer being very short and very petite because of her mindset. And if she can pick up a new sport and qualify for nationals, which she did, and we talk about that, that mindset can carry on to anything else you do in your life. On this episode of All About Fitness, 
Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Please check the older episodes and you'll hear some great content with some of your favorite fitness stars and some of the researchers explaining how fitness is changing your body. But for this episode, for episode 133, it really is an honor to sit down and, and talk to Jen Wiederstrom. And I can tell you this. I can guarantee you this, guys, listening to her, having been around her just a little bit. If she could coach and work with each and every one of you right now, I know she would. She has that passion and she has the integrity. Just some of what I know from her from outside, she would work with you, but unfortunately she can't. So we talk about that today, how she can help coach you even though she can't physically be with you. On this episode of All About Fitness, it truly is quite an honor to really, and I I hounded her quite a bit. So Jen, thank you for the time. It's quite an honor to have a wonderful and interesting conversation with Ms. Jen Wiederstrom. All About Fitness is brought to you by TerraCore Fitness. TerraCore is a great platform. It is part bench, part stepper, part platform. You can lay on it, you can stand on it, you can step on it, you can throw it, lift it, carry it. The TerraCore, there will be a link below in the show notes, the TerraCore is voted one of the best pieces of home equipment by Men's Health Magazine. To see why, go to www.terracorefitness, that's T E. R-R-A, fitness.com, TerraCore Fitness, changing the way fitness is done. Using code AAF, that's AAF10, to save 10% on the purchase of a TerraCore. All About Fitness is brought to you by Hyperware. Hyperware is the maker of sand bells, soft bells, and the vest. If you love body weight exercises and are always looking a way to just challenge yourself, a weight vest is a great way to do that. And Hyperware makes the best weight vest out on the market. If you're looking for a vest that stays form-fitting, doesn't get loose, and doesn't get too squishy when you get sweaty, check out the vest by Hyperware. That's H-Y-P-E-R-W-E-A-R.com. Of course, there'll be a link below. And use code AAF10 to save 10% on the purchase of a vest for your own home use. That's Hyperware.com, the makers of the vest, sand bells, and soft bells. Use code AAF10 to save 10% on any purchase for your own use. You know, I had, I posted something um, a day or so ago about like the gym in 2019. And it was like, you know, I run a private women's group and uh, on Facebook and one of the women posted it. And it's like, Hey, when you see somebody new, lend a hand, be kind, offer a smile, offer input. And it blew up. I, you would have thought it was like a butt pick because I had like 11,000 plus likes. Yeah. And it's because people that are new don't feel like they belong there because they feel out of it. And by the way, I don't know about you, Pete, but I started as that nervous person in the gym, not sure what to do. And I was a D1 athlete and I got out of that and I kind of didn't know what to do. And it, it, it's like, a, it's, it's, it, to me, it's an onboarding, it's creating a place and a relationship and a loyalty around a brand saying, oh, I started back with this, whether it was pe- post baby or post 20 years. Like my mom started CrossFit at 65 because she was like, I can't walk anymore. I can't run. My knees are bad. I'm old. So I was teaching her the rowing machine and I got her into CrossFit like a trainer. And now she's 70 and deadlifting more than me. And I'm like, fuck, I better start working out harder. (laughs) You know? So she just needed to feel like a place that she belonged. People just have to get unstuck. And I think what's good, I know it's not sexy, but it's stable. This is what you do. Why do you think curves are still so successful? You show up. You know the circuit, you jump on, you listen to the beep, and you just fall in line. You don't have to think, you don't have to feel, you just have to show up, and we got you. And that's why, and and by the way, being in all women's environment is part of why they're so successful. I am Pete McCall with All About Fitness, and I can't tell you how excited I am today. I really am. And Jen, I just want to say thank you for your patience, and thank you for (laughs) putting up with my persistence. But today we're speaking with Jen Wiederstrom, who you know for, well, Jen's just awesome. So (laughs) Jen, how are you doing today? I'm I'm like smiling ear to ear because you're, you're like you're so emphatic. You're so excited. <laughs> I've known you for a long time. This is probably the most excited I've ever heard you. Well, thank you. But it, it is. I mean, because I see everything you're doing. I see I see your energy and your enthusiasm. Even just for listeners, we had a little conversation before I hit the record button, 
And immediately, and I've known, yeah, as Jen said, we've known each other a few years, but she said one or two things that we'll go into, and she just, she solidified me. I already had a ton of respect for you, Jen, um, but just what we're mm-hmm. talking about really ju- just nailed that. So people will know a little bit about your background, but you're from the Midwest, right? You're from, uh, yeah. the middle, from you're from one of the flyover states. Where exactly are you Chicago, from? Chicago, man. Born you're from raised. Chicago? Okay. Yeah, man. Where, what part of Chicago? Uh, so Southwest suburbs, my, both my parents were city kids and then, uh, we, I grew up like in Naperville, Lyle. And then after I got through college and everything, ended up going, uh, into Lincoln park. Um, so I mean, I I guess, but God, before I got to LA, I was probably, you know, 24 before I left Chicago. And what was, so what was it like? What were your fitness influences growing up? Like what got you into interested in being active? You know, it's, it's a funny kind of anecdote because I started, so both my parents were coaches and teachers. So we, movement was always a part of our household. My dad had like the old school iron weight set in the basement, you know, the old bench where there was like two kind of like upside down C's that held the bar. And, um, so I, and I was doing gymnastics. And so I would always go down there and do like really light upper body. I was like eight, 10, 12, you know, and my dad still claims that I was so good at gymnastics because of his weight training with me. Um, <laughs> but all over the walls were pictures of like these old bodybuilders like Lee Haney and, and Corey Everson. And of course, Arnold and Louie and, you know, I mean, just, just every, all these greats. And so very young, I discovered not really knowing who they were, but when I saw Conan the Barbarian, I was like, oh, Conan got it. That's what I'm going to be that, you know, and like red Sonia. And I was watching all these silly, like fantasy movies, but really loving it. And then when I finally, I think I got to, you know, fourth or fifth grade and realized that Conan was actually a person named Arnold and that he won the Olympia all these times. And, you know, and, and having met Arnold and worked with him several times and we've hosted events together, I did tell him the story, but it was funny because Arnold had muscles and I, I always did. So it kind of made me feel, felt special and like cool. And he had a really long last name. It was hard to pronounce. And so did I. So I kind of felt cool. And he talked really funny. And I went to speech class for like six years. Oh, really? So, and I talked funny. Yeah. My R's were just, the, the R's were not happening. So the fact that he talked funny and I talked funny, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. Like, and I, he kind of just, without even knowing it, realized that exactly who I was was okay. And I always was kind of a little weird and always kind of kept moving and Sports and movement were a big part of my life for a long time. Um, but it was never, you know, Peter was never about exercise. I never understood sets and reps. I just did sports. So I knew that like if I did a in the gym or at practice, I would be perform better. So it was that, it was that way for years, even through college, I went to university of Kansas, um, and was, um, ended up doing hammer throw and got really good at it. So, I mean, from, from the big 12 to, to, you know, regionals and nationals and competed at a high level, I I got out of college and it was the first time I actually started to learn. I feel like about movement because previously I never had to have an emotional connection to it. I just did what coach told me to do and I did it. So although I had been moving my whole life, it was for sport and performance and it was never about health and understanding of the effects of the body. And even though my degrees in sports administration, and so I understood, you know, anatomy lab, kinesiology, physiology, all of that stuff, your biomechanics, it was more that hands-on understanding for myself out of college. Um, and you know, everyone talks about like the freshman 15, I had like the graduating 30. I don't know what <laughs> happened. I, I just was going from like, you know, two or three day practices in, in, in at Kansas and then to like nothing in bartending and like nachos were a really important food item for me, you know? So I just like kind of blew up and I kind of started to learn. And then when I started, um, I, I think formatting a really unhealthy way around food and restriction and crash dieting. And I didn't really get it. You know, it was, so, it was bizarre that at 25 years old, you know, I'd already done gladiators at that point. I was still crash dieting, comparing, l- like just tearing myself down because I, again, now instead of working out for performance, I was working out for only appearance for TV or, mm. or, you know, for a- external, um, attention or validation. Well, so, real quick, I want to, sorry if yeah. I, I'm cut in because I want to take a, yeah, I try not to do that. I don't like stepping on, on, uh, on people oh, I'm interviewing, always. but here is the, the, the thing that, that you said that, that fascinated me, like you, you paid attention to Red Sonja and, and I, you don't need to tell me your age, but what type of influence did eighties movies have? Cause I can't tell you, Jen, almost everybody I interview that's about our age group, give or take 
we were influenced by 80s movies, right? Because that is it, like that's why I started lifting weights when I was 13, 14 years old yeah. because of Arnold Schwarzenegger. How, did 80s movies, do you find yourself, was that kind of like, like you saw that and you're like, whoa, that's so cool. Were those an influence? Yeah, it's something different. And it's not just 80s, it's 80s action. And, and because what, what's, what's kind of, a, I, I literally watched Red Sonja last night. So this, t- this co- timing of the conversation couldn't be better. It was because... And it was like the men were men. Like you look at superheroes today, look at Xfinity <laughs> War. Like everyone's got really good chest and shoulders. I'm like, Duh, uh, wh- why are we skipping leg day? And you look at Dolph Lundgren and like Mash of the Universe, and he's got bigger hamstrings than like my face. And I was like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like it was, you know, and even, you know, through the years I've gotten to meet Dolph, talking to him about his training for Rocky Four, the way him and Sly would get up and they had this like really cool, like Eastern European trainer and they got one big bowl of pasta in the morning and that was all the carbs they got. And they just like trained, they trained for the movie. Like they were training for the Super Bowl, you know? And, um, and so they were like real, like they were, they like walked the walk, you know, and they were just big and, and strong. And, and the women were, um, like just they were glamorous. grounded. They're, they're glamorous. Yeah, yeah, they're sexy and like, but like, like st- strength in there, like even the lines, even the dialogue, it, it was just like. But uh, it wasn't all CGI either. I can't go watch. I can't watch a modern action movie, Jen, because it's like it's like watching an animated movie. I don't want. I want to like in the eighties. You had Van Damme, even though there's stunts, th- you didn't have you know computer animated graphics everywhere. It was real action, like you know, like yeah. you said. Yeah, you know, and I think we've gotten away from that. I, I think it's so funny that that you you say that, that to hear that inspiration. So to get into athletics, because you played a sport in college, correct? Oh yeah. And what was what did you do in college? So well, the, the long and short is I walked on the rowing team. It was just god awful at it. You know, I've still some of my best friends on the planet from that experience. But I am not what you call an endurance athlete. <laughs> I'm. I always joke that. Um, I'm, I'm as good as anybody in the entire world at anything up to about four or five seconds. And then, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, it peters out. So, so when you have a sprint and rowing, even on a, in a boat of eight where you're cruising, it's still over six minutes. I mean, it's just, it's just terrible. So I, 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 um, the, the throwing coach, Doug Reynolds, who's still one of my dear friends was in the weight room and watching me lift, which was like my, like, that's like party zone for me. And he's like, wow, great athlete. She's got a great central nervous system. She must be amazing. And the rowing coach was like, oh, oh no. Oh, she's terrible. Like she <laughs> works hard. But we can't we can't put her in a boat. She's so bad. And and Doug's like, I want to crack at her. So then Doug Reynolds took me over to the hammer throw side and taught me hammer throw. So I ended up walking on pretty late and started my junior year. And then uh was was you know, you know, in the rest is history, you know, what the junior year, you know, it's a very technical sport and it's the longest throw. So you have six seconds to fix it. You have six seconds to kind of screw it up. And, you know, my first year I was pretty bad. Uh, second year got really good, you know, placed, got to regionals placed, I think fourth or fifth in the conference. And my senior year, you know, b- you know, barely got second in big 12s. It was an awesome, awesome throw off this great girl from Oklahoma won, but it was like, just a rad battle. So second, in the big 12 went to regionals, got third or fourth, and then went to nationals and got top 15 or top 20. Um, my dad would know, I can't remember, but you know, it was just like, okay, there you go. So well, uh, to you- me, yeah. Well, what you can't see and what listeners can't see is my jaw is literally on the ground because <laughs> you're not, I mean, th- you're right. The hammer, I was my roommate in college. I had a roommate in college who was, we were D3, we were a small D3 school, but he was all American in both the put, both the shot and the discus. And we had, this was 1992 oh, wow. in, in our, in our, in our apartment in 1992, we had two TVs set up because Mike would watch the video of him throwing from his practice and he'd watch video of like East, like East German and Russians throwing. And he would always compare mm. his technique to their form. And so now that I do this for a living, you know, and I you know work with athletes and I refine motor skills, it's so interesting to have watched Mike go through that because this was he was trying to qualify for the ninety two Olympic trials. And oh, I think sure. he, yeah. yeah, he missed the mark by just a meter or two off the um off, oh. off the discus. Yeah, he's yeah. Oh, it's painful. Um, oh. But just watching that and, and he was tall. He was like six foot four, six foot five. You're not, Jen. Yeah, <laughs> so, no. So I'm when you look at throwers, deal. when you look at throwers, it's levers, it's power. So to me that you walked on in college and you made it to that level of D1 top 15, you are, I mean, explosive. What was it like to pick up a sport like that 
and obviously you, you got really into it. It's just interesting to hear that you go from picking it up to, to qualifying. How is it? And we'll talk about that experience. You know, I mean, part of it, it's a lot of it's mental game. So you've got girls that are like, I mean, I literally felt like I was throwing against Brian or you know? Yeah. They're big, they're strong, do a two or three turn, they grip and, and it fucking flies. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, but here we go. Yeah. It just flies. And, um, and for me, it was about precision. It was about so there was a few girls that were my height that we just had like a couple of Christmas hams as quads. So you had, I mean, and by the way, like my, my back squat was 315. I was snatching almost 200 pounds. Our training was at a, at a, at a level that, um, that had to exist in order to be at that level. So a lot of kudos to the programming and Doug, but also those reps counted. And I think it was for me, once you get out there as well, as you know, I mean, and I hate to bring it up, but I don't know if you caught that bears, Philadelphia Eagles game. It's who can show up on game day. I don't care what's going on. I don't care the pressure. I don't care if every single throw in warmups, I hit the cage or went out of bounds when it's time to compete. You have to have that switch to nail it. And that was something that I worked just as hard as the reps in the gym. I had, I would, I would literally do weird stuff like have a shoelace untied or have the grip off on my hand, knowing that no matter what I can nail it. And a lot of times in sports, you'll see people that cannot step in and can't not deliver. And that was for me, what happens because what is that work? Like a luck is when a work in meets opportunity it's like, well, you create your own luck then because I'm going to work my yeah. tail off and the opportunity is this event that I qualified for. So uh, I guess call it luck or just call it that I'm going to make this happen for myself because I prepared myself physically, but also mentally. And I think a lot of people overlook the mental component. And it's funny because I look at throwing, I, you know, I had every reason to make excuses of why I couldn't keep up. But I was like, well, why don't I just kind of go for it? And to me, that kind of thinking is what I think has propelled me in my career because as you know, what we do in the gym is a microcosm for the big bad word out there. And what I practice in here, whether it's quitting reps or adding on reps, is how I show up in my life, in business, in relationships, in conversations, and people feel that on you. And, and like that's the big, like that's the biggest thing I kind of I, I think I'm seeing now, uh, going on a slight tangent, but and I, I I have this feeling where, you know, if someone I'm like Pete. You know, I need 10 reps out of you and all these exercises. And maybe if you're the exercises, you know, it's a long day, it's a Friday, you're this, and you just do eight out of 10 on some of them because it's heavy and you're tired and you're like, what does it matter? The problem is not just the eight out of 10 because the, the, the reality is, is then because it works out there, you became an eight out of 10 on your podcast. You become an eight out of 10 with your clients and your presence in the room. You become an eight out of 10 with your family because you're willing to accept less from yourself because you've allowed that in you. Okay. That's actually not the scary part, okay? It's the fact that your eight becomes your new 10, and you don't even know it. We're so adaptable that we're like, oh, I'm at 10. And then guess what? Your new eight is a six. And before you know it, you're at a four. Although it still feels like an eight to you, you're a four out of 10 in your life, and you don't know how you got there. And to me, that's where people get stuck. And that's why you can use sports, you can use the gym as a really good tool to remind yourself what a 10 feels like based on your mental uh, commitment to yourself, your mental decisions. Because I, I don't know about you, but like what I'm seeing more and more, all of these physical um, distractions of weight loss, I need to lose weight, or, or the dysmorphia, the other direction, right, of getting too small and having body conscious issues. These are mental health issues. So I think if you work the brain using the tool of movement, we're going to have some success. And that's, that's, to me, what a lot of what my college sports taught me. And it, it's a mindset. I mean, you're, you're, what you're talking about, Jen, is you make a decision that whether you're throwing or whether you're walking to a gym or, or whether you're, you're doing an interview, um, you know, I mean, for a position or you're trying out for a part, you're, you're having a meeting, you, it sounds like you commit 100% to what you're doing in the moment. How did, how did it, how'd you develop that mindset and, and how do you share that, that kind of enthusiasm or that focus with others? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing quote that the way you do every, anything, so I'm going to start over. The way you do anything is the way you do everything, you know, and I was kind of looking at that. And then Gunnar Peterson, a good friend of mine, my favorite one from him is effort is sexy. And I was like, that's, that's what it is. It's that combination of effort and who I am. And, and, and I think you learn a lot about yourself in, 
in those kinds of moments. And I think that when what really gets tough is um, when you look at work, cause I'm a co I'm a, I'm a people coach. I'm a human coach. And I think what people are really getting stuck is they get stuck within themselves. And, you know, you can look at the rock and wow, he's so popular, these followings, all the stuff and the movies and blah, 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 you know, fill in the blank. He is so impactful and he is so effective with his following because he does the work. He lives at that level because that's who he is. And he gives, he inspires people to say, wow, I can ask that of myself too. I think it's really easy to find our end caps and feel safe. But as, as I have found out, especially through television, I mean, I've gotten to do television and it's really easy to ride that golden carpet, you know, and just be on there. And I did biggest loser and I don't have to do anything else. And I've kind of made my stake in the ground and that's enough, but man, I'm bored, man, I'm bored when I do that. You know, you can, it, it's about taking risks. It's about putting yourself out there. What good is it if you know every time you go up to swing that bat, it's going to be a home run, right? Like that's boring. I, I, you got to go. You got to take squeezes. You learn about yourself. You learn about the landscape of what other career you're in or the people you're with by trying. And by the way, there's no motivational, nothing motivational, or I should say nothing more powerful motivationally than pride. Like I did that. I, I don't care if I failed and I swung and I struck out. I still went, I still did it. Well, I was just about to ask that about that F word, Jen, because from what it sounds like, you're not afraid to fail and and how powerful, once once you own that, (laughs) you're terrified of failing. What do you mean? Talk about that. What do you mean? Oh gosh, it's, 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 it's the, it's the mark of any, any uh, struggling perfectionist. You know, you, you just realize that you're not, you're not perfect and failure feels like I'm a fraud. If I mm. fail, then who am I? Who have I presented and who are people getting versus who I promised them I would be? And and what I've realized is the closer I have allowed failure to be in my life, the happier I've become, the more I have learned and the greater I've grown. And further, the deeper my relationships, the more respect I've gained from my peers. Because I'm like, gosh, I don't have the answer. I, this might be a mistake, but I'm willing to take the risk. Because what I don't want to do anymore is keep hiding behind a show or a human or another person to make my decisions for me. So if it's a failure, it's their failure and not mine. Because now I don't, I, don't, I don't feel the lesson, and I also don't feel the pride if it actually comes through. So yeah, I know I hate failure. It feels uncomfortable and terrible. But I do know whatever is scaring me right now means I'm ripe for change and growth and development in that. Usually that resistance means you're ready. Well, is, well, think about it in, in the weight room, right? Because you can't you can't grow, you can't get mu- you can't grow muscle, you can't get strong, you, you can't add definition without discomfort. Because if right. you just do the same five weights, five reps for fifteen, you know, five pounds for fifteen reps, you're not doing anything to the body. So, listeners mm-hmm. out there, if you keep doing the same weights all the time, stop. Challenge yourself, yeah. you know, because in, in order for muscles to grow, you need to push them to a level of discomfort. And it sounds like for you, failure is that discomfort because the way I've always looked at it is just what you said. Failure, while not pleasant, is a learning opportunity. You can say, you know what, that didn't work, but hey, I'm going to go out and try it again. Having, mm-hmm. But just that, that attitude to try when it comes to doing something like weight loss, whether people have to lose 100 pounds or they just want to lose a few pounds to go back to a reunion – how important is that mindset towards weight loss or just healthy adopting healthier behaviors? Well, here, here's the struggle and here's what I'm seeing. We have all this information at our fingertips, right? And then we see this gap between the information and possibility and desire to actually doing it. And I've been living in that gap as a coach, as a motivator, trying to convince people to take a step, to start, you know, one step at a time, walk towards that. And I think if you get started going, you'll make it. But what I'm realizing more and more is the greater catalyst and that I'm trying to create for people now is personal testimony. So they need proof, not of success, but of survival, that I can try these things. Uh, and it might be nonlinear, because by the way, everyone listening, life uh, progress, anything is not going to be linear and that's actually good, but they don't practice survival. They don't know what's going to feel like, what they're going to think about themselves, what someone's going to say about them by trying and failing. And so until I can put them in scenarios where they get to try and fail or try and succeed, they're just going on my word. And I, you know, at this point, there's almost 8 billion people on the planet. I don't have the opportunity to sit down with every single human and build that trust for them to believe me. I'm biggest loser. Yeah. 
yeah, I spend five months there every day at the ranch working with them and they trust me and it's it, it helps. But people trusting themselves is only gained by their own personal experience of trying. And to me, the more I put people in that kind of environment, um, the, the, the better off they are having a long-term success and being willing to look at the weight loss and being willing to be a little uncomfortable because that's, that's the environment I've created that like, Hey, this is, this is, and by the way, in normalizing discomfort and normalizing pain, I have a new book that I'm working on. I don't have a title for it, so I can't even help you with that. But it's, <laughs> I have this chapter called Buffalo Courage and I was listening to a podcast, um, Oh, a friend of mine, Bert Soren, was talking about this podcast he listened to and how buffaloes, when there's a storm, run right into the storm, but cows run away from it. And cows like sit in the storm because the, the, the storm almost like follows them, <laughs> right? And buffaloes are in and out in like an hour. They're a little bit damp, but they're through it. And I started getting fascinated about, wow, how, how do we learn to run toward, toward discomfort, a storm, Right. And what teaches us to run away? Is it is it the environment? Is it our p- teachers, our, our 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 family, w- practicing what it feels like? Because a little calf wouldn't have an idea. I'm just following the people that are bigger than me that go forward, versus the buffalo. The little buffalo is like this seems crazy. I am super uncomfortable, but they go toward it. So then I was like, okay, is it n- nurture? Is it nature? And then I thought, how funny that when it comes to physical pain or discomfort. Um, you know, let's say I'm, 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 I'm on a run and I roll my ankle and I'm like, Oh my gosh, what did I do? And I stop, I stop in my run. I slow down to a walk. I'm a, I'm curious and I'm gentle with myself, right? I'm walking it off. I'm testing maybe where the pain is. How bad is it? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for maybe signs of what's going on, how it happened. Maybe I look if there's a pothole, what created the pain, what created the discomfort. Maybe I call you and I say, Oh my God, Pete. I, I roll my dang ankle. This is bananas. And you're like, you know what? You should try. You give me a suggestions of things. Maybe you even have a doctor, an acupuncturist you offer. Maybe I go ask for help. So now with physical pain, I'm curious. I'm graceful with myself. I'm asking for help and I'm seeking for a solution, right? That's great. But the moment it's a mental or emotional discomfort or pain, we become cattle. And I don't understand where that shift happens. I mean, literally an entire chapter in my book is called Buffalo Courage because I'm like, I want to understand that about people and teach people how to be buffalo. And for, you, you know, <laughs> so, but you, to, to cut in, but you, you say that, and I've been, I've been kind of in this mindset maybe for the last six or eight weeks of just, you know, I go around, I, I do a lot of talks at various conferences, and the one thing I, I'm kind of, I'm almost done. And, and, and if, if I'm wrong, maybe you can, you know, you, you can tell me, I think you'd be the, you'd be a great person. To give me some feedback on this. But when you look out there in the landscape, Jen, and you see how many people, and it's not just all about losing weight, right? It's about being healthy. It's about adopting healthier behaviors. So you have a high quality of life. There's so many people that have done that. There are numerous people that have flipped the switch, whether they've lost 10 pounds or whether they lost a hundred pounds, or even if they didn't lose any weight, but are just being healthier, that I'm almost at the point of, I don't want to excuse anybody anymore. Do you know what I mean? Of where there is no excuse. There are all these people out there who have done it. And it's just like, there's so many resources. To your point, there's so much information, whether it's via the internet or whatever, there's so much information we know about this. That's kind of like, why, what's holding people back from just being healthy. And, and I, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not vilifying anybody. It's just something I've been kind of like, for, you know, you know how you have an idea, no. kind of just you yeah. know, running around your in your head. Hey, what do you, what do you, what's your, you know, because because I look at that because there are enough people out there that have done have done miraculous transformations or have adopted healthier behaviors that, and I think maybe that's our fault in the fitness side of it. And I'll, I'll include myself as a spokesperson because we make it about appearance and about weight loss and not about health. Would that be? Well, you're not right, but you're not wrong either. Here's the thing. That we cannot be judge and journey. I cannot start to begin to think what's going on in an individual's life, which makes them ready or not ready for any kind of transformation. We are at best all just trying to make our lives work. And I think what, what's happening, the people that aren't ready, well, basically, I, I think there's like really, really two signs of this line in the sand. One, the people that are protecting their life the way it is, feeling comfortable, they're protecting, feeling safe, they're protecting, feeling in control, they're protecting their coping mechanisms for whatever pain is in their heart or their heads or their history. Okay? That's it. The other side of the line, 
which is what I feel like I'm, I'm finally on is I'm protecting what I've worked for. Mm. Like I'm protecting my health. And by the way, there was a long time that I looked healthy and I wasn't healthy and I was emotionally distraught and I was comparing myself and I was starting to become a bulimic and I'm on national television for gladiators and I was a disaster. So I don't care if I had abs, I was unhealthy. So now I'm in the si- other side of the line where I've been able to release my coping mechanisms and my, by the way, you know, if you think that the judge, like your judgment or your, your, your point of view on like, come on, what are you waiting for is bad. It's nothing compared to the individual. And so I'm on that other side of the line where I'm like, well, you know, my voice, my mind is there, but I'm wanting to protect the healthy life I've built. I will not trade this for anything or anyone. And so I wake up fighting for it. It's a daily choice. The choice, the relationship I choose every day is me. And I think a lot of times what happens is we unknowingly shift into this victim mentality of, you know, and by the way, the definition of a victim is when someone or something is responsible for the way I feel. Mm. I was like, I'm not a victim. And then I heard that sentence. I'm like hundred percent a victim all the time, all day. And I, and I, and the, the, when you start to choose the relationship of you, your relationship with others, your relationship with God, if you're spiritual, everything starts to open because you're owning and responsible for the experience of yourself. So to me, it's that side of the line. It's, 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 I know it's easy, but you've already seen the other side and you're starting to protect the life that you've built. Those other people that aren't there yet are, are A, uh, on fumes because of gimmicks because our industry is in a lot of ways a fraud. They, they, they give you the happy pill of the weight lost the workouts, do this thing, do that thing. And look at how great I'm doing, but they're really not happy people on the inside. So ultimately they're going to revert. A lot of contestants on my show, I did not have enough time to emotionally work with the components that are within them to help sustain the behavior. Weight loss is easy, but weight loss is a side effect of something greater. We can, I can get anybody to drop weight. This is, this is, this is the science. This is just easy. This is just work and, and consistency, but having them mentally change and letting and getting them on the other side of that line of protecting their health versus protecting their that safety, you know, and that that's the line, and it's a, it's an individual experience for each person. And well, this is and this, this is one of the things I enjoy about the conversations that I have on the podcast because yes, you're helping me see this from a different point of view. You know, I interviewed Mike Boyle mm-hmm. not too long ago about about changing your mind. I mean, why do we, why is it okay to sometimes say, you know what, I was wrong and. Um, you know, I was wrong and I'm going to change my mind about this. And, mm. and you know, and that's, and so and that's, that's, that's why I like these conversations. Because oh yeah. You're right. You know, I think I look at this, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to go on this thread first for a second, Jen, because I look at this and I can't tell you how many women I've interviewed for this podcast who have dealt with, and, and I'm talking like top, like yourself, like these are top fitness people, top leaders in our industry and they've all dealt with body issues. Yeah. And, and I've, you know, I've dealt the same, you know, and it's like people that know me, I purposely carry, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast, you know, I wore Husky jeans. When I used to go shopping at Sears as a kid, my mother had to buy me Husky jeans or maybe they're JC mm-hmm. Penny. But, and mm-hmm. now that I'm in fitness, I look at it more as exercise gives you the ability to enjoy, enjoy life. And that's really what I try to get people thinking about. It's not about mm-hmm. appearance. It's about quality of life. Oh yeah. Cause we're, we're, movement is access. That's all. Movement is 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 something so much greater than appearance. It's freedom. I mean, it's freedom. Oh my God, it, it is. It is. Free. Well, on the other side of fear is freedom, right? So mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, you like move. I mean, listen. Like if I if my entire career rests on my waistline, I'm not going to be making it very far, <laughs> right? That's that's too much pressure. And by the way, that's not a commodity. That's usable for anybody. People mm. follow voices. They follow hearts. They follow leaders. And, and if you're leading by a visual representation of what you think a leader is supposed to be, you're going to be very mistaken and you're going to feel very alone. There's a Netflix special right now, Generation Meme, all of these multi-million, you know, uh, followers, all these people, uh, and they're, they're, they're suicidal, they're depressed. If they lost their following today, could they go back to being themselves tomorrow? That is the, that is the line in the, in the, in the film. Mm. And that's it because that is enough. It, you know, the, the reality is, is the sooner we all come off our pedestals and realize we're the same, that, that the rock to, to a Jen Salter, to any of these people that are uh, these huge, to any Kardashian, they are no different than me, no better, no worse. 
We all have the same stuff. And the moment you embrace it, it changes. I think what's going on, though, is that to me, and I had some major things happen for me this year, that I cannot, I know I can't stay here. Right, I know in this mindset I can't stay here, and the pain of staying here is actually greater than the pain it will take to seek, to try, to fail, to grow, to survive. So, yeah, I'm going to play my hand over there because it's still going to be hard, but less painful than inaction, than you know what I mean, than 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 this this feeling of 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 of, of static, of of not changing, of not challenging, of not trying. Ugh. And right. that is, you know, that that's the stuff that that we all that we all face. And, and I'm going through something, you know, some personal stuff on the back end. And that is, it's like there was, there's a huge fear, and there is a lot of pain, and there's a lot of, I mean, it's not easy, but I know it's the right thing, and that after the pain, there will be growth for everybody involved. Oh, and it's not easy. Of success. What's that? Regardless of success, yeah. you'll, you're going to have growth. I mean, that, I mean, I get teary when you were saying that because I'm just thinking like. You know, I mean, I literally have, I had a mentor of mine a year ago. He was 51 years old, Sean Perrine. I know mm. you know him. Mm-hmm. Died, you know, quite suddenly. We knew he was sick for maybe two months and he was gone. I have another mentor, 62 years old. He was my health teacher and diving coach. And he has the same tumor that McCain has. And he is one of the brightest, most special people on the planet. And I, you know, I've been, I, I went to see him because we have him on hospice. And, and like the only thing he keeps saying and his wife is like, we had so much more we wanted to do. And to me, seeing losing these people so young is all the evidence I need to remind myself to like get up and go. I want to go to bed exhausted every night of trying to live more and push because death is there for everybody. And I don't want to be morbid, but it's like, you just don't know when it's going to end. And I know I'm going to use my time. And that, period. But that's just, it is, yeah, we don't know because it could happen today. It could happen 30 years from now. And that is the one thing is don't you want to have your best life possible? Don't you want to have, you know, the best thing that you can do and, you know, so why not? I mean, yes, it can be uncomfortable to start something new. And and part of it too is when you look at the health club environment, it is so scary, Jen, to walk into some of these clubs and it is so overwhelming to walk in and see a thousand million square feet of all this shiny equipment Mm -hmm. and people, you know, there was something that somebody posted just the other day about how people were making fun of a heavyweight person in, in oh. the gym in January, and my heart broke. And I know you recently oh. posted something about that because, yeah. you know, and actually this is somebody I want to introduce you to. I just interviewed him recently. I don't know if you met Jamie Atlas. He's in your neck of the woods in Denver. Really? No, I don't oh, know. Oh, my, you got to meet Jamie. He is okay. the coolest. He's <laughs> like a seven-foot-tall Australian. He played professional basketball in Australia Can't for a wait. while. Perfect. And he has, a cool, <laughs> he has a cool little studio right in downtown called Bonza Bodies. And he does a lot of local TV and radio um, in Denver. So I'm surprised you guys oh, haven't. Oh, I know. Man. Yeah, exactly. He could have helped me with my Christmas decorations. Dang. Oh, yeah, exactly. He's like, <laughs> seriously, he's like six foot nine. Um, but we talk about this all the time about how do we just, he makes, actually, he, what he does is he makes movement fun. For people is he makes it oh, fun. Yeah. He takes away the stress and he ta- takes away that. And what do you think? I mean, because I think that's the hardest part for people, right? Is getting through that emotional hurdle that, yes, this might be uncomfortable, but remaining the way I am is more uncomfortable. You know, and, and, and with your experience, and I don't want to – so many people have said so many things about The Biggest Loser. And my mm-hmm. opinion of it is if it got one person off the couch and got them moving towards a healthier life – then, then job done. You know, you can take a look at all the other stuff. But if you got people moving forward, you know, is that is that why you did the show? Is that why you agreed to be a part of it? You know, the the my biggest loser experience is a fascinating one. You know, ultimately we're at a time where uh, we are digitally more connected than ever, and everyone's feeling more disconnected emotionally and interpersonally than ever. So, to me, loser was an opportunity to be on a platform where part of my messaging could at least get to their heads and hearts. Um, because, and the, and the reason I think I did so well on the show was because it was never about me. It wasn't being a TV star. It wasn't the celebrity. It wasn't money. It was, I was there for those people and they knew it. And I still, I mean, God bless it. I've got both my, my teams are on Marco Polo now. And like the messages that go through, you know, from, different weight loss to 5Ks to, you know, Sonia Jones just had her skin removal surgery and she's healing and she's happy. She's been consistent with her weight loss. Like we're still together. We're still a family. And I think that what, 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 what Biggest Loser provided was an opportunity to 
experience the human condition. You don't have to be a hundred pounds overweight to experience what these people are going through or my emotion back with them. And that's why the show was such a catalyst for hope and for movement and for possibility in the, in, in anybody that was watching. Um, I, I think that ultimately uh, biggest loser was my first attempt at really being in a bigger platform to get my coaching out there. And it's tough because you were just talking about you know, every single one of those people, they didn't want to go to a gym. It was tough for them. Or like even my, my last season, Colby Wright and Hope, their nearest gym is 50 miles away, five zero. There's real obstacles here. I mean, and I literally, I just launched a, a new platform called New You, N-E-O-U. And it's, it's literally like Netflix for working out. So I can be back in the homes of people because, because I, I, I just think, and by the way, I mean, the, you know, the, it sets and reps and working out, but it's the messaging and it's the coaching that I put in there. That's, that's to me the most special about what I'm doing on that platform, because it's, it's, it's a people just, I feel like, feel like a feel alone and biggest loser brought people closer. And like, that's why it's like, okay, can I do it when I go on Dr. Raz? Can I do it with this new you app? What can I do to create a closeness, even though we're so spread out? And that to me is the ultimate goal. Well, and how, but let's talk about this and because this is one thing where I think people in more rural areas definitely have a tougher time. How important is it to, to do something in a group environment to have, because you guys split them up in teams and how powerful is the group dynamics? If I'm trying to change, if I'm trying to change behavior, whether it's losing weight or whatever it is, how powerful is that group dynamic? And, and is that something that people should look to if they're trying to do something different in their life? I mean, look at the most successful kind of community franchises you have. You have Zumba, you have CrossFit. You know, what they've done is created a sense of belonging. And and when you're not there, it's like, hey, where were you yesterday? We missed you, right? When I, when I any kind of CrossFit I did, it was, it made me feel like I was my college team again. Um, so to me, it, it's, especially on Loser and any kind of group environment, it's almost like you're... I really have to believe in them for the both of us in the beginning. And what helps you create consistency is the community. So belief comes, from, I think, from a coach and from within. Consistency comes from the community. Because it's like, oh, you're getting up, I'm getting up. Or, you know, in the house, they hear somebody making coffee. It's like, oh, all right, I'm going to get on the mile. We have like a mile loop at the, <laughs> at the ranch. You know, I'm up, I'm up, I'm up, let's go. You know, or when it comes to dinner. Like I was like, I remembered like they hated eating anything green. So I would, I would chop up spinach really small and put it in their tuna salad. And I showed them ways to like make it better. And, and like, the, so like Colby had it, they're like, someone's like, what if Colby's doing spinach, I'm doing spinach. And it comes this like really, you know, um, healthy competitive component of, well, I'm in, you know, I, and I feel like for me, you know, coming to Denver, um, I've missed, I've missed the team. You know, and I had a conversation last night about them. I'm like, man, I must be a part of a team and not working out for competitions, but like a, a, a team of, 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 of accountability and consistency that kind of keeps you going in life. And I think a big component uh, as a coach, one of my greatest tasks were with loser contestants, with anybody else I work with, with people I care about in general, is finding a team for them. Who's in your Who's in your front row? Because that's going to, that's going to be, that's going to direct so much of the content of your life and the conditions of that environment. And that's, you know, that's a great way. That's, that's kind of a great way to frame it is, is that, you know, we're all in this, this together and it really is, it, it's that accountability. And I think yeah. when, it, when it comes to this, I think there is that, that fear of, Oh my goodness, I'm going through change and I don't want anybody to see that. And, and what's been, what was like the most powerful for you? What's been the most powerful? And the, and the question I want to ask, well, I'm, I'm going to change because this is a question. I had one of those, I'm an old man, so I had one of those little brain farts here for a second. I forgot what I want to no ask. No problem. <laughs> so for listeners, I apologize. I was about to go down a different rabbit hole. But I want, what I wanted to ask you was, you keep using the word coach. And yet yeah. for years, we've, we've referred to what we do as personal training. And we're starting to see that yeah. evolution. So what is the difference in, between training people and coaching? Yeah, I mean, I, I keep saying, it, uh, the, you know, the world needs our coaches back. Um, I, I love that there is, you know, we, we kind of talked about if one person got off the couch from watching Biggest Loser, it was worth it. Great. You know, Jen Salter, she posts all these butt pictures. If one person sees that photo and wants to walk around the block or do some squats, dude, she's a peer. I'm pumped. I could care less how, how she motivates. She's, she's, uh, she's doing it. And, and yet... She's not coaching, 
right? There's there's influence and there's influencers, mm. but what are you influencing? Are you influencing good habits, bad habits, body image, uh, improvement or dysmorphia? You know, it's really up. It's up to be decided based on the viewer or the audience member. Whereas a coach takes a personal responsibility in your life and in your evolution and actually cares and adapts and knows and connects. And it knows more than anybody that this is not about me. This is about you. So to me, a, a real coach and, and um, any of my top peers, from, from Gunnar Peterson to BJ Godore to David Jack, like all these men that have been mentors in my life, we are in the service industry. That is it. We are here to provide service, care, support. And it's our responsibility to help navigate people while they've got their hands on the wheel. Like I always joke, like, you know, like I might be the wind in your sail, but you've got to navigate this. You're the one doing it. And I'm providing service and support. And that's what coaches do. They understand and, and they're with you and they take responsibility for your wellness until you can take it on, take it on for your own. And that's really the difference because I've seen too much of a, uh, it's about me as the, as the influencer or the Instagram or as the, the, the trainer. Um, and I, I've also seen a lot of strangeness, uh, 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 especially in the fitness field and especially amongst women, this idea of scarcity. Like, oh, I'm not going to post with you because then you might get followers and you get more followers than me. It's, it's why, why are we not uniting? Why is there so, so much divisiveness but, over who gets what? But that it's, I had a wonderful to... call. Go ahead. Well, but, but, but you need leadership to show it. Like I had a great conversation with Kaisa. Uh, she's a, a Kaisa fit on Instagram. Okay, hold and she's on one just second. Like, uh, Kaisa, yeah. Kaisa. Jen's calling you out. You need to come on the show. Return my emails. Oh, okay. I'll, Sorry. I'll Go ahead. Her. So I'll you're talking. No, you're talking with Kaisa. Um, Go ahead. We talked Sorry. about what things can we do together. We're trying to, like the amount of Christmas Abbott. We talked about when can we be in the same city? I'm literally going to Wadapalooza in a week and running a women's panel. I'm, do, I'm doing something with Gabby Reese. You know, this is not about furthering me. I want to further them. And by the way, they probably feel the same thing about me. That's what's elevating people. And this is not just like a girl power thing. This is about, there's, Again, as I've said, almost 8 billion people on the planet, trust me, there's enough to go around. We need to support each other. We need to be with each other. We need to be collaborating and seeing what we can do to create more offering. You and, know, and, I mean, That's I'm, so true because years ago when I was training full-time in the gym, there's so many trainers that are like, they're so protective about their clients. And I always looked at it like, you know what? If I'm not doing my job and my client goes with someone else, goes with someone else that's on me. I got yeah. to be, be on my game. I got to be engaged. And I got to be focused. Dude, and you know what? That's, yeah. <laughs> I wanted, if you if you came to me, Jen, too, it, I was not afraid to say, you know what? I'm not the right trainer for you. We share totally. trainers. I would have friends, I would have colleagues go out of town. I'd train their clients. I'd go out of town. They trained my clients. It was totally. a very collaborative because to your point with the, with the issues and the unhealthiness we have in our country, waste it's a waste of energy and time for, for you and I not to collaborate. And you're doing so many cool things that, you know, I want to see... I like working with other professionals, I, and I love staying in the background. I don't mm -hmm. want to be front and center. You know, it's like well, I, I want to be in the background because I want to elevate and just keep people thinking mo about more activity. Well, and you said waste of time, but again, it, the, uh, it, who is it for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're doing this to further your following and do your stuff, man, are you missing out? You yeah. have missed the whole point. It's a really great story. Tim Gunn, uh, you know, rent the, uh, not at the runway, uh, uh, Project Runway, and he's in all these shows. And I, I remember it was my first season of Loser. We had this huge rooftop reveal for um, for the makeover week. And, I, you know, I was trying to put on all these dresses, and I had these, like, killer, like, smoking hot dresses. And, and I was putting them all on. And I, I kind of looked to Tim because he's, you know, he's the pro. I go, what do you think, man? And he goes, Jen, you could look great in a potato sack, but tonight's really not about you, is it? <laughs> and I was like, and I just was like, I just want to look good. It's a huge show. It's the highest watch episode of the season. I want to look hot. And it wasn't about me looking hot. It was about honoring the progress of my contestants. It's not about me. And that's what got me. So collaboration, if I can collaborate with Kaisa or Christmas or List, any of these other females that are out there and doing it. And, and, and elevate them or even like I'm mentoring all kinds of women here in Denver. I do one-on-one. -on -one. I sit with them. I talk with them. Where's their business? Where's their head? Where's their heart? What's going on? The, if I choose not to collaborate and for anybody listening that doesn't want to collaborate, you're making it about you and you've missed the whole thing. You've missed it. 
and you're going to continue to miss it. And by the way, feel more and more isolated and more and more alone. And I can list a, a number of women that are behaving that way. And I'm not going to call them out. I just was like, God, when they're ready, they will call. And I'll be there for them with open arms. But man, it's painful to be to watch. Well, and so I look painful. At, but it, and I look at that as we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to to, to have a positive impact. And you know, I would never. You know, I might tell people, yeah, you know, I want to listen to that. But it's a way about creating that positive energy. Now, a quick question. I'm going to start wrapping it up because I really respect your time and I appreciate you know your energy. We talked. You talked a little bit about body dysmorphia, and and you're somebody yeah. who is known for being fit and known for being muscular. Have you ever felt any backlash from being like, have you ever felt criticism for being overly muscular or for oh, being yeah. overly strong? And cause I see that it's like you walk a fine line about, okay, you have this. And then, you know, when women do start exercising, there's that critique. How to have you overcome that? Because we know the benefits of strength training and yet there is this stigma against women's strength training. How are you trying to shatter that, that stigma? You listen, leading by example is the number one way because I, I, there's no amount of things I can say or do to convince anybody. And I, and listen, I do not negotiate with terrorists. Okay. If you're going to come at me <laughs> and, and start to belittle or behave in a way that's trying to make me feel less because you're uncomfortable with where your progress is or your body's at or whatever, that is, this has nothing to do with me. And I actually feel sorry for him. You know, I, I do. And, and so to me, it's a matter of, I've had my own battle of it. And I, I mean, li and listen, I won the genetic lottery. Thank you, mom and dad. I'm Swedish, Danish, Polish, and German. My mom had a washboard absence from doing dance. So I've, I've got that. But like, it's been my responsibility to wake up every day and keep it. I could easily be 100 pounds overweight. I could easily be back in Chicago bartending with, a, with a, you know, with no working out, no sense of health, no sense of self. But I made this choice, and when I'm healthy, this is what my body looks like. So at this point, let's, let, listen, like I, I, you know, I'm single. I I love looking good naked, and I'm excited to be in a relationship. So that pays off. That's fine. You know, that's always a fun like component, but it's an ancillary to how I feel good in my skin. Because the reality is, and this is what people don't realize, it's not about the the look of it. Like again, the way I look is an accident. And people will come at me like, you're muscular, you're this, or you Photoshop or you that. It's like, oh man, middle finger to you. This is what happens when you take care of yourself in my body. This is what happens and what looks like for me. But the reality is I'm not protecting the waistline and the way my legs look. I know if I'm not taking care of myself, meaning I'm not getting sleep, I'm not getting enough food in, I'm not training because by the way, what, weight, what moving iron does to my mental health is like through the roof awesome. But I become less of myself. I'm, 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 I'm more insecure. I'm less energetic. My eye contact is poor. If I am in a relationship, I'm less sexual. I start to doubt what I have to say on a stage. And, I, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know, like my body's been able to maintain, but if I'm not taking care of myself, it is reflected in the woman I am. And for me, I will not, I will not go down the rabbit hole and lose myself. And for me, that's what I'm protecting. So when people get all weird about how it looks, it, it, it's just, you know, like worry about your own paper, man. I got my answers over here. You worry about your own. And that's like really what that. it comes down to, like you what, know? And I think what, what I hear, what I hear you saying, Jen, is, is confidence. And what I hear in your voice is confidence, is the fact, and it's a journey, right? Is, is, and I'm sure some days we're better than others, but how much, how much does strength training, how much confidence does that give you? And, and isn't that why... I guess the follow-up to that is, shouldn't more women strength train just to develop that same sort of confidence? Well, what's cool is is you learn a lot about your self-movement, right? You learn about your courage. You learn about your mental toughness. You learn about... Uh-oh, I'm losing you there a little bit. Uh-oh, are you there? Um, uh, what's it called? Like, do a set of weights... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I just I just lost you for a moment. It sounds like your your transition. I know we're about to wrap up, yeah. so I appreciate your time. I'm transitioning, but I wanna I'm, I'm like finishing, so I'm like it's it's fine. I just was like I gotta get in my car and start going. Yeah. But then you and I could talk forever, Pete. Yeah, no, um, no, this is awesome. Yeah. So. But um, but what I was gonna say is um, you learn about these interpersonal things of yourself again. The 
is the strongest. The voice of the mind is always the one that you're going to hear more than anybody. I can, you know, it's, it's really not what people say about me or my muscular body or anything like that. It's the way I think about myself that is the loudest in my head. And that will have the greatest effect on my output, my self-worth, the way I approach a conversation, the way I approach a podcast. So the reality is, it is down to who we are um, based on that. And that's why for me, weight training, you know, I love doing Olympic lifting, clean and jerk snatches. I love, I love squatting heavy. I, to me, physiologically, I love what it does to my body and my hormones and everything like that and the hardness in my muscle. So I love proving to myself that I can. And to me, getting reps in the gym helps me prove the kind of woman I am and can be in my life. And that's why I strength train. So there's there's something about the, the you know the, the what iron teaches you there's I, I i didn't come up with this statement but there's this idea that like you know the barbell doesn't lie whatever the weight is like going up going down moving it being willing to what you think about and the person you are when you're underneath that pressure of a bar of a life of a situation you know fill in the blank and to me that's that's what it, that's what it teaches you that is, and see, that's such a powerful thing, right? Is is it teaches you the ability? If you focus, you can do it. Now, your book, I, I love. When I saw this book come out, Jen, I have to say that it really is. I was blown away by by your concept and by the format. And that's diet right for your personality type. You know, why is mm-hmm. why is understanding your personality relative to nutrition and movement? Why is that so important? It was funny when I was writing that book. Uh, I was like, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the diet? What's the trick? I'm like, yeah, so you're not going to get that from me. There is no trick. There is no thing. Get enough sleep, get enough water, get enough food. That's success. That's what's going to create weight loss and optimal health. I, there is no trick, right? And, and trying to put it into a format was a struggle. And then I realized, you know, I can only, I can't format one work, one uh, food plan and, and, and system of, of health for everybody, but I can format a plan to a person that's what we do with personal trainers right so i I just i realize that so much has to do with our personality and you know there's five personality types of a quiz that you can identify who you are and if you're an organized doer you know and i give you a very laissez-faire plan you're going to feel freaked out unsuccessful and annoyed and vice versa if you're that rebel who you know i always joke that like these are the people that basically need light guidelines they're kind of bumper bowling like they can do whatever they want but they will stay with my guidelines they're going to find success and, and further if i gave them a structured step-by-step thing they heard it would be too overwhelming so i really think and i know through years of experience that if you focus on the human you honor you honor that system for them and you pair a program to who they are and their default behaviors and you and you educate them on what i see is the greatest asset and the greatest in- Uh-oh. Uh, of who are. Uh, you just chopped up on me there a little bit. Now you're saying something so powerful because you're right. It really is it, it really is that ownership and, and just taking that, understanding what's right for you. And I'm going to take this to, to a weightlifting thing, you know, is when you look at it, you know, your personality type, as you mentioned, you and I are not endurance people. We're strength and power people. And, and for right. listeners out there, it's important to understand how your body reacts to movement. And it's also important to understand how your personality maps to what you're doing in your healthy behaviors. Because in, in your mind, when, totally. people, when, you're, when people have, have made that switch, how powerful in this and what type of success have you seen? Oh, it's, it's been my, my favorite part, my favorite feedback of anybody that, you know, it was just so easy. I go, yeah, I'm on, like, I'm on your side. I'm, that's the whole point. Health is easy. Health is for everyone. But we are jumping through these hoops that we're told we have to jump through in order to be successful, and that's just not it. It's, 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 it's truly about knowing yourself enough to, to be able to set yourself up for that kind of success. I mean, I, I personally, from my book, I test as an everyday hero. So I'm someone that puts others first, makes excuses for why I can't go, but I, me working out by myself, no way. But if I told you I'm going to meet you or I'm going to go to a group class, I rise to the occasion. So I know that I need that. Other people don't. So the moment you know what works, you just you just you put you put in that key and you turn it and you're in because it's it, you because you are you are shaping it around your behavior. I mean, this is this is again everything starts with the mind, and if you can go there, you're going to be set up. 
And that's and that is such, I mean for listeners that that is such a powerful thing. I'm going to repeat that. It starts with your mind. Is once your mind makes that decision, the body follows, right? Oh, completely. I mean, because here's the thing: at, at, at the very baseline level, weight loss or weight gain, right, transformation physically comes to your body trusting you. So I always equate it to people. If I'm like, you know, I, I'm you and I are friends, and and you say, um, let's meet up and we're going to do this this project. And then I'm like, oh, I need a bail. I can't for all these reasons. You're like, okay, no problem. And then I bail again and I bail again. You're not really going to trust me and show up for the meeting if you know that I'm probably going to bail again. Your body reads your inconsistency through movement, nutrition, everything, your sleep. Based on you, uh, if you're bailing, it's like, well, screw you. I, I can't count on Jen to give me enough water. I can't count on Jen to give me sleep. I'm going to kind of be in this high cortisol level and hold on to everything until I know otherwise. So what starts to happen is if you create consistency with your body, it starts to respond. But what offers your body consistency is the mental decision to create those habits and to begin those habits. And that's where it has to start from. And, and what's, what, what, I, what I enjoy about our conversations, Jim, when we have them, is not only are you, you know, not only do you have, I don't know how am I going to say this, not only do you have the appearance that has gotten you opportunities, I mean, I mean, you're beautiful, you're attractive, but it's your energy, your enthusiasm, your commitment to, to what you're doing that really sets you apart. If people want to want to be able to work, and you can't work with everybody, right? I mean, you want to, and we talked about this before I hit the record button, yeah. you want to work with everybody, you're, and that's why you did the show, I think, is that you want to help. You have a helping and giving nature, yet 200, 300 some million Americans kind of hard for you to do that so how can how what have you set up because you do coaching and you do online programs right and what and, and what, yeah, do you, what well, type of stuff do you do you try to do with that to a degree you know i'm at this place where um i mean i'm on social media across the board it's just my full name jen Wiederstrom, and you know it, it, the correct spelling i'm sure people put in the episode um but the biggest step i took is that neo you platform it's it's, it's because online programming it's new you it's, it, yeah, N E O U. N E O U. Um, yeah, and I can send you a link that you can include if they want to find me that directs them to like my page on there. But the reality is, is online programming is one thing. I need more time. I want people to experience what I'm doing with them. And it's, based, it's, it's streaming workouts. I also have coached the camera stuff. Where I mean, the number one streaming content on the platform now is me speaking to camera for eight minutes about the new year and direction and. You know what I mean? And, and, and taking risks. So to me, that, that, that's been the biggest thing. And I'm also, obviously, my book's out there, Diet Right for Your Personality Type. I am in the midst of writing my next book. Um, and I guess some of the things that my sleeve that aren't quite ready for announcing yet, but it's a, it's a matter of really finding new and exciting ways to engage and stay in the world and the homes of all of you because, um, you know, just as my parents were coaches, I'm a coach, and that's what I know I'm here to do. And for listeners, I'll have all that information. I, I've gone over on Jen's time, and Jen, I, I really appreciate your availability, and I really appreciate <laughs> your patience with my persistence. But I've, obviously, you've heard her change. But I'm going to have all of your contact information because you are doing really, you're doing amazing stuff, and your energy is so enthusiastic and, and, and so positive that I really, the reason why I'm doing this podcast, Jen, is to try to put the right information out there and try to get the right people yeah. in front of listeners. And you are definitely, yeah. definitely one of those people. And so I really appreciate your time. And, and, and really, I'm so stoked with everything you're doing. And I'm going to put you in touch with Jamie Atlas. And for listeners, Jen mentioned David Jack. And just so you know, Jen, you didn't know this, but he's going to be uh, the next podcast. So after you, you're going to be followed up by David and, uh, and Mike Piercy because I'll <laughs> talk with them about their uh, strength oh, training God, program. Thanks. What's that? Oh, thank God I went first. Oh, my God. Because once DJ's on here, you know, he, he's, he's, I mean. And I haven't spoken first. with BJ yet. I don't know BJ, but I, I, you know, I'd love you, to have him on. Uh, and, yeah. And, and, but, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned David and you mentioned uh, somebody else who I interviewed. Oh, Gunner. I interviewed Gunner, Gunner a, long, a while yeah. ago. And, and, again, I really was blown away. And, and, and this is because you, you see these people. But Gunner's one of these people. A few years ago, I saw him at a, at a conference workshop. He was just at a Perform Better, just learning. And that's where I met him, and, and we talked a little bit. But he's one of these people like you that, that, yes, he's in the media. Yes, he trains. 
whatever celebrities, for, for lack of a better term. But his passion is yeah. for his clients, whomever they may be. He could be training a grandmother. He could be training uh, Kardashian. He still brings the same enthusiasm, the energy, and the passion. And that's exactly what you do. You have the energy, you have the enthusiasm, yeah. and you have the passion that's infectious. So thanks a lot for your time. For listeners, I'll have all of Jen's contact information below. And definitely she can help you get into new, better you. Aw, thanks, Pete. This is so much fun. Thank you. If you're new to All About Fitness, that is the type of interview you can expect on a regular basis. What I try to do is have a conversation with my guests. I want to ask them not just about fitness, but about who they are and what made them who they are. You know, Because we all have backgrounds. We all have stories, right? Jen talks about growing up with parents of coaches. You know, she was a bartender for a while. She, did, she played sports. And you don't even understand, Jen is a very uh, petite. She's not, she's not tall. She's not petite, but she's not tall. And throwing a hammer is all leverage. My roommate, I talked about in the interview, who threw the hammer and threw disc and threw uh, the put in college, yo, know, he threw the shot. You know, I you know, hung out with the, with the throwers. Throwing the hammer is hard. I've tried it. It's really hard. It's very technical. So to go from picking it up to qualifying for nationals within a very short time frame at the Division One level is uber impressive. What's even more impressive about that was the first time I met Jen, I mentioned, I mentioned you know, here's this, you know, completely very, very attractive, intimidating. She's so attractive, she's intimidating. But we're having this killer conversation. You know, we had a couple of mutual friends there. I didn't even know she was on TV. I really didn't until the next day when somebody pointed out to me that she was on uh, The Biggest Loser. And I didn't know that, you know, whatever. I mean, it doesn't, don't watch the show. I was just blown away by how nice and engaging she was. And we bumped cross paths. But what I wanted her, reason why I wanted her as a guest is her, her enthusiasm, her energy, her approach. She is, and what we talked about really is becoming comfortable with yourself. I mean, that's what I heard in our interview was it's this journey. Jen had this journey of becoming comfortable with who she is. And, and I don't know her that well, so I'm not, and I'm not trying to throw that on her, but we've all had that journey, right? From my journey, from wearing, you know, husky jeans and always being a little heavy and now I don't, you know, I'm a little heavy and I'm not the, I'm one of the few trainers who's not going to be doing half naked selfies or six pack abs because frankly, it's not that important. What's important is I don't it get injured. What's important is, you know, I recently you know, moved and, and was able to carry furniture all weekend without having my back hurt. I can go play with my kids. I can go mountain biking. I can do any activity I want. And yeah, like Jen said, I might be able to do it for four or five seconds. I, no, but in all honesty, I can do almost any activity I want with a very minimal risk of being injured. And that's what being active means. And what Jen is trying to do, she's trying to, the reason why I asked her that coach question is, you know, for years we've been just telling people what to do. Do this, do that, do this. And you know what? That doesn't work. That does not work. You know, just telling people what to do, you know, I can tell you to, to do that. You know, I can tell you don't touch the stove. But you have to take ownership that touching the stove is going to have a negative outcome for you. If you put your hand on the stove when it's hot, you're going to get burned. So you have to understand that there's negative outcome. That is taking ownership. I can say don't touch the stove, but you're not going to take ownership of that. If you understand that touching the stove is going to cause physical pain, you now own that concept. Exercise is a very, very much the same way, and healthy behavior is very much the same way. I can tell you, I can say be healthy, exercise, do this. And Jen's point about using coaching is coaching means she's trying to help you come to a point where you take ownership of it. She's not telling you what to do. She's saying, hey, what can you do? What can you do? What do you think will work? Okay, let's look at what hasn't worked. We don't want to, we don't want to stay where what hasn't worked. Coaching is about trying new things, about having that confidence. That fear discussion and that failure discussion is powerful. And it is hard for a perfectionist you know, to, to be afraid of failure, but failure is a learning opportunity. One of my favorite coaches one time said, I'm not afraid of mistakes. Don't, don't be worried about making mistakes. Just don't repeat them. Don't make the same ones twice. You got to find out what doesn't work in order to find out what does. It was Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, who said, you know, I tried to make a light bulb 10,000 ways. I, I, I found 10,000 ways it didn't work before I found the way that did. That might not be the exact quote, but that, that's a long, you know, I'm, I'm summarizing it. But he found all the ways that didn't work before he found, figured out the way to make the light bulb. In your life, in your journey on health and fitness, you know what? There is no perfection. 
There isn't. All we can do is try to get just a little bit better each day. Try to do things a little bit different each day. And you know what? We're all going to have those days. Jen posted recently, you know, just of not, you know, getting off her diet for a little week, for a little bit. And we all have those days. Stress gets, you know, sometimes stress gets on us. And you know what? We either want a cocktail or we want some food because that makes us feel better. But you know what? When you wake up the next morning, it's a new day. It's a chance to get a little bit better that day. I used to do this with my clients. They used to come in, well, I did that. I haven't been. I would do that little absolution. I'd make the sign of the cross and say, you're absolved. Don't worry about what you did or didn't do yesterday because we can't do anything about yesterday. Yesterday is out of our control. What we can focus on is on the here and now. So for listeners, if you're trying to get a little bit healthier, focus on what you can do in the next hour to be a little bit healthier. Sitting up straight, drinking more water, being more attentive. Just do the little things. Do the little things. What can you control? Do a little bit at a time, and you can definitely have a healthier life. Yo, I'll have all of Jen's contact information down below. She really is, and I mean it sincerely. She is very giving, very engaging, very enthusiastic. If you ever get a chance to see her speak, please go do it and support her. You know, Do her coaching program, buy her book, because she's doing some killer work. You heard her enthusiasm. You heard her sincerity. And that's why, really, I wanted to have her on. So, Jen, thank you for putting up with my persistence. Hopefully, it wasn't too much. And for listeners, welcome to All About Fitness. You're going to expect to hear a lot more of this type of content. Jen Wiederstrom is Jen, W-I-D-E-R-S-T-R-O-M. That's Jen Wiederstrom on Instagram, at Jen Wiederstrom. My Instagram tag is Pete McCall. That's Pete McCall underscore fitness. All this stuff is going to be down below in the show notes, as well as a link to my new book, Smarter Workouts, The Exercise of Science Made Simple. I also have a link to Jen's book down below. All we're trying to do, folks, is give you information to help you have the healthiest life possible. Thanks for stopping by. I look forward to having you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.